Hi, I'm Jamin. You're listening to the Happy Market Research Podcast. Actually, you're seeing the Happy Market Research Podcast if you are joining us live today at the IIEX event. Um, today, this show is being done in conjunction with IIEX's podcast series, and it is also going to be produced in our uh, regular show feed um, on wherever it is that you consume uh, podcasts. The topic for today is the rise of esports and how consumer insights are being used to make decisions. Um, this is something I am really excited about as I'm a lifelong gamer. I've been doing it since I was, gosh, early days of Apple II uh, and Atari 2600. And now um, I'm 49 years old, <laughs> still gaming with my kids, which is maybe a little bit embarrassing. I think I'm going to probably carry it with me to the grave. Um, uh, we've got two guests today that are joining us. Our first one is Laura Levy. Laura is a human factors psychologist specializing in how people interact and engage with technology. She started at the Institute for People and Technology and is a research director of gaming and esports applied research at Georgia Tech, where she specializes in esports research, as you've probably already gathered, uh, <laughs> games, user research, AR, VR, and human-computer interactions. Laura received her BS in zoology, which is super interesting, from the University of Florida, a MS in biology, and a MS in psychology from Georgia Tech, and is expected to earn her PhD, I think in, uh, gosh, within like six -ish months, uh, spring uh. of 2021, <laughs> uh, from Georgia Tech. Laura, welcome to the Happy Market Research podcast turned Thank blog. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, before we introduce uh, our next guest, Emma, who is the UX lead for a large video game company out of Finland, I'd like to set some context. Um, maybe you could tell us, Laura, a little bit about your parents and um, what they do and how that's impacted who you are today. For my parents. My parents, I come from a, fa a family of scientists, really, and I think that had, it, it obviously had a lot of impacts on what I do now. So like on my dad's side, he's a geologist. My mom's side, they're all self-taught naturalists, pretty much. And I grew up in Florida where you have all different kinds of, you know, ecosystems. So it was very common for the house bookshelves just to be full of field guides. And, and not just like, this is a bird field guide. It's like, this book is only about wading birds or mm. raptors so that explains the bs in zoology because uf at least at the time you either had to pick animals or plants so you were either a botanist <laughs> or a zoologist right and it just seemed very natural that uh you know you go for a walk and it would take you an hour to go a mile because you're like what kind of plant is this like what kind of rock is this so that had a huge impact on me developing as a scientist up until this point so your parents, uh, scientists, were you an only child? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. And in fact, they're, they're big sailors and big water people. So we basically lived on a boat for a lot of my childhood, which made it super fun because it was like those field guys were in the boat and then you could just go outside or hop in the water. And you know, I had a little underwater slate. Yep. So my parents also big scuba divers. My dad was a or is or not anymore, but a cave dive instructor, my mom an advanced diver. So I learned to scuba dive before it's even legal to teach people to yeah. scuba dive, which is generally the age of 12. And yeah. I had a little slate, so I'd hop in and be like, I saw five squirrel fish and two <sighs> queen parrot fish. And I would do my own logging, be like, this reef seems healthy. You know, I'm like 10, <laughs> but I've made that the, decision. <laughs> the it's interesting you came from a very tactile, real world, what I call real world, uh, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, the physical space that we occupy. And now you've kind of moved your career from that to a digital context, to a digital world where we're actually spending lots of time. Um, why did you make that transition? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting question because to me, the thread of my career makes a lot of sense but mm -hmm. uh sometimes people are like why do you have all these degrees in biology but now you're working in tech i i study behavior so i have about 10 years experience 
working as a marine biologist. I studied dolphin cognition. I worked for the international shark attack file at UF studying shark attack behavior. So it was all about like, what do animals do in the natural environment? And what are the techniques that you can use to understand maybe why they're doing those things? So when I made the switch, which was honestly around the recession, I worked for a museum exhibition company, traveling um, but the bodies exhibition and the Titanic exhibition. Recession happened and I just kind of worked my network and they needed a behavioral person to look at thousands of hours of video of older adults playing video games and they needed a statistician. So that was kind of that STEM toolkit that I had. I was like, yeah, I can do statistics. And I applied the yep. biology observation techniques to this these videos. And that's how I got into games user research. So it's basically still like, what does this organism do when given this thing? In this case, it's a game. We also work on you know apps and other types of health technologies, wearables. To me, it's the same research question. It's just instead of it being an animal's I mean, people are animals, but it's, it's in people and you can ask them questions and they tell you things, which, you know, dolphins and whatever else don't, don't do as clearly. Sometimes people don't either, to be honest. <laughs> I really want to dive in on this topic, but unfortunately we don't have two hours. <laughs> they've, limited our, they've limited our time. <laughs> it would be fun to meet in person at some point and chat about that, about that journey. Cause I do, it's interesting how the digital is now I've been thinking, I have a, a uh, five-year-old, he's in school, uh, and in California, the school system that we're in is all fully remote, so he's spending literally five hours a day on Zoom calls um, mm -hmm. with his teacher, and uh, some of it's one-on-one, -on -one, most of it's in, in group, and it's been really interesting from an uh, ethnography perspective, just me as a dad sitting back watching his learning, the things that are going really well, and actually probably accelerating relative to a classroom environment versus, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise uh, maybe not going as well or things that he may be missing. Um, and so, but regardless of the outcome uh, on the learning side, his comfortability with technology is going to be like, is exponentially higher right now, let alone in two, three, four, et cetera years, right? I mean, like it's a, there's a redefinition that's happening um, with us in the way that we feel about how technology connects us. Um, and so like in that framework, this is a little bit of an older stat, but it was projected that 2020, the global esports market value was around a billion dollars and it's projected to be 1.6 billion in 2023. So, um, which is huge growth. I mean, it's massive growth yeah. in a two year period. Uh, let's kind of level set for our audience right now. What is esports? Yeah, so there's, I, I think that question has two answers. So the the simple answer is esports are just games played at a competitive level, often to right. huge audiences. Pre-COVID, live arenas, Madison Square Garden sold out. So that's a venue of 22,000. They didn't use the entire right. arena, but for the Overwatch finals in that first year, they sold those tickets out like months ahead. So that's the easy answer. But what I like to... Uh, communicate about what esports is, especially to students, because I, I teach some classes around esports at Georgia Tech. In their head, and this is what esports is now, modern esports is part rock concert and part like Super Bowl. The pageantry, there's fireworks, DJ Collins there, there's, uh, you know, just super fancy graphics. They hype up the players as superstars. But really, the first time we had an esport was like in the 1950s, a game called hmm. Space War that was played on basically a souped up oscilloscope. And there's some oh. really cool photos that you can find, black and white photos of clearly engineers, pencil thin ties, white button up shirts <laughs> and slacks. And they're all crowded around this computer that takes up an entire wall playing this game. And then from there, we get things that look more familiar to today. So you can find pictures from the 1980s, um, you know, world championships, people are doing some of the first LAN parties. So even though esports to us, especially in the Western hemisphere is kind of new and feels really souped up, it's been around for a while, particularly like, uh, you know, in the Asian market, esports has been huge for 20 years. So it right. seems new to us now, but it's been around for a minute. Huh, interesting. All right, great. Well, let's get our next guest in. Emma Vario is the UX lead for Frozen Bite. 
Rosenbite was founded in 2001 and is headquartered in Helsinki, Finland. Now with over 110 employees, Rosenbite has 11 published titles, most recently Boreal Blade, which is a team-based melee fighting game, which is uh, focused on player versus player. Uh, they also have the Trine series, which is a best-selling game in the adventure genre. And they are scheduled to launch Starbase, which is a space-based MMO with a fully destructible and infinitely expanding universe uh, focused on building and designing spaceships and stations, exploration, resource gathering, crafting, trading, and combat, which all those things sound fantastic to me uh, in context of like my MMO background, um, which starts way before there was even a GUI uh, back in the ROM mud days. Prior to joining Frozen Byte, Emma has served as both a software developer and software designer. Emma, thanks for being on the Happy Market Research podcast turn blog. blog. Thank you so much for having me. It's super exciting to be here. Well, as always, we have this standard question just to give a little bit of context of uh, who you are. Um, tell us a little bit about your parents and how they impacted what you do today. Oh, gosh. Um, actually, my dad has done a long career in marketing and is now teaching that in a vocational school, I think. Um, and my mom has been doing a lot of clerical things. And when I was younger, she was a stay-at-home home mom for much of my young life and yeah I guess that's if I had to guess where my curiosity for how people and things work and to make things better for them is po possibly that's one explanation for it. Do you um so marketing is interesting from your father uh specifically relevant to like relevancy inside of communities, right? Because that is really the underpinnings of marketing. Um, uh, has, do you guys talk much about your current work and um, how, you know, marketing tactics, those kinds of things could be applied or are being applied to growing your community? Um, we do talk about work. Um, but not on that level that much, um, partially because my dad was a marketing director toward the end of his um, industry career. And he was more about like number crunching and managing people instead of doing the actual marketing. Mm. And I support marketing here and there, but my focus is slightly elsewhere. Got it. So while we're both interested in similar things, it's not exactly the same. So, Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right, great. Let's kind of jump into to the discussion now that I've got both of you here. Um, when do esports companies reach out, Laura, to to you? In other words, like what is the business problem that they're trying to solve? Yeah, so I, I think there are two main challenges the industry is looking at right now for esports franchises and the reason why we work with um, our industry collaborations. The first one is fan acquisition. Mm -hmm. So especially now with COVID, we're kind of starved for watching anything yeah. at all. So we've seen traditional sports try things like uh, have the NASCAR drivers played this in a NASCAR-esque type of game. So with things like Overwatch, we work with uh, Atlanta Rain, which is the Overwatch franchise for Atlanta. They're working on this tribalism piece. So if I live in Atlanta, you know, it's painful, particularly for us, but I cheer for the Hawks or cheer for the Falcons or Atlanta United. There's a lot of people that see Atlanta Rain and go like, hey, I want to get into that, but I've never played Overwatch and I don't know what I'm looking at. And a quote when we were doing studies of novice viewers, people had never seen Overwatch League streams before, the quote was, everything's happening all the time. Mm. <laughs> and they want to get into it because they want to have that, that thing, but they don't know what's going on. So in terms of fan capture and fan acquisition, how can we create maybe tools or experiences or activations so that people can feel connected to a team, a franchise, a game? Because ultimately, the goal of esports is really to drive people to play that game more. That's kind of the business connection. 
And the other piece is player health and safety. We know a lot about sports science and how to support a team, like a college football team, a professional um, like NFL football team, but we don't know what that looks like for esports athletes. And they're younger. Many of them, maybe they didn't do so well in high school. They didn't go to college. They started when they were 14. They were pulled out of their parents' houses. They don't know how to right. eat right. Benefits of exercise, managing strong emotions. So how do we construct teams that support these players so they don't burn out and so that we can hmm. get the best performance? Because obviously a franchise wants to have a very competitive team mm -hmm. that drives viewers and championship titles um but we there needs to be some research there to understand like how how do we even do this so those are the two main things that um the esports industry has contacted us about at least emma anything to add any other reasons why or um uh maybe even furthering these points that laura just mentioned um not really i work in a very different space so that was it's always interesting to talk to Laura and hear that side yeah. of things because that's not what we think about at all, really. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, when is research employed um, inside of Frozen Byte? We have a fairly solid idea of what kind of games we're going to make. So it's more heavily geared toward, or like we do that more heavily toward the end of production, the production cycle. Uh, and it's always design and the game first. So we do very little pure marketing um, research, for example. We do some of that, but it's more about how does this game play? How do people see things? How do they react to things? And like, how do we set their expectations? That sort of thing, very much focused on the game. And then we go from there. So a lot of... Um kind of level testing uh, where, yeah. right, okay, where you're, you know, in a simplistic way, I'm going to try to explain it. You'll have to correct me, <laughs> please. Yeah, um, I went on very high level. You can go more detail. No, no, that was, um, so it's kind of like, okay, level one players are, you know, getting through level one so quickly and then, um, or they're not, they might be, you know, getting out and then level two and so on and so forth. So that you're kind of like maximizing that transition from thing to thing. Um, exactly. maintaining the engagement through the yeah yeah and the seeing because usually first few levels are tutorials of how you're like right. how you're introducing the mechanics and everything to the players do they understand everything do they even see everything because there have been instances where we teach a mechanic and they've just missed it completely and then later on they're confused in like seven seven levels in when they need that to proceed and they just don't have that skill on their yeah. mind so this and also the pacing of how things are going forward once you get past tutorials and everything how do you guys gather that feedback it, it, in, th in the, is it directly inside of the system or is it like post our most uh, utilized method is to invite people into our offices obviously we cannot do that now <laughs> and we're kind of <laughs> scrambling but we invite them in and have them play the game and we're recording through the webcam their face, but also the screen what they're doing. And we have people monitoring what's going on. So we see immediately if there's a problem and we can take note of that, oh, we need to fix this. But also if there's a game breaking, breaking bug and they get stuck mm -hmm. so people can come in and help them. But mostly it's hands off, just watching them play, taking notes and then like taking them and moving on and fixing things. I'm really excited about the MMO. Do you guys have a, just cause I said so this like, the only kind of game I'll ever play now, um, <laughs> right? And the reason why, which I think is interesting, is the connection. It creates the human connection with in a video game environment, which I find very attractive and fun. Um, and yeah, and I, apparently I'm not the only one. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so as you as you're um, getting ready to launch, do you guys? Have you, I assume you've done some betas. Um, yeah, we're and, and, currently in closed alpha. So. Prior to this, we did some testing on like, how, are we getting the tech right? Mm -hmm. uh, and all these sorts of things and more contained things. And that's when we invited people over. But we started closed alpha toward the end of spring. I don't remember the exact date and are progressing 
toward early access launch. So, but now it's contained number of people still a lot more yeah. than we had in just our studio, which we did like huge play sessions on Friday afternoons, like everyone's playing just to see if we crash this. But now it's hundreds more players. And we have actually a tool built within the game so they can take a screenshot and say, this is an issue that I'm having, or this is where I'm Got having it. an issue. So we get that feedback as easily as possible from our players. Yeah, I think that I think the integration of consumer feedback, you know, inside of the systems that we're using, um, you know, the video game industry has largely pioneered that. Uh, and, and now that we're moving into more and more of a digital interaction, uh, where a good example is this, this event, you and, you know, the three of us would have met historically, we would have met in person and done it on a stage at IEX. Um, and, and now that just isn't feasible. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're able to, like, if there is an issue with the product that we're using to stream, then, you know, there, you're going to see more and more introductions of what is your experience like and ability to be able to get that consumer feedback. Um, I did have one last question on the MMO thing, just out of personal curiosity. So I do apologize about the divergence. Um, uh, it, space MMOs have been tried in the past, right? Um, and some at varying levels of success. Uh, I'm really interested. <laughs> were there lessons learned from some of the other um, uh, products that are titles that had gone out that you guys have uh, employed? inside of Starbase? Uh, yes and no. These sorts of games, they are in development for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And interest for them, and they started cropping up around the same time. So they were all in development for a good while. Obviously, we're coming out a bit later than some. So we've heard and like been, like been able to kind of see how they build off of that first. But a lot of the core things that we've had and we've, like the mechanics that we've built and the tech uh, has been there before the others have been launched. But obviously, as they come out, we see how they do things like tutorials and like what things look yeah. like maybe so we can kind of rip off of that a little bit, but not cool. the core things, yeah. Got it. Well, hopefully the audience will take time to Google Starbase and sign up. Maybe some of them will get into a beta. Um, hopefully, yeah. I'm really glad that you're interested in it. I'm super yeah. excited. I'm just grinning like a goof when you're talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, we could talk about a whole episode on this topic, but um, yeah. we, we won't. We will stay on topic or get back on topic, I should say. So, um, Emma, who in the organization is using Insights? Um, I think it's mostly like through designers or that's the mindset that we do or like we have. So everything is like, okay, how do we design the game to be better? But obviously once we have the insights, they're public for the entire company and then they're used by marketing and management and everybody else. But the idea is what kind of experience are the players having currently? How are we going to make it better? And then like, everyone can take their takes. Mm. Uh, like I forgot the word, but like, their ideas from there, like what they, like, how are they going to go forward? Got it. When you're developing a new game, um, do you have like injection points of consumer insights? Like, is it part of the milestone or part of the um, uh, build, measure, learn, or however it is that you guys are framing out the you know, innovation wheel? Uh, that depends a little bit. We sometimes have um, agreements with a publisher and mm -hmm. then they have a set like schedule for milestones and then they might impose things for, for us. Usually they want to do like their own insights things with uh, yeah. a deliverable that we give them. Um, but with us, it's more a touch and go thing like, oh, now it feels like we could do something with this. So let's start mm -hmm. testing. And then it's not as scientific as it could be, but it works for us. <laughs> Laura, how about yourself? Are there, um, with the companies that you've worked with, are there points, like static points inside of their processes where they're injecting consumer insights? Yeah, so for us, mostly we follow uh, what's called a user-centered design process. So often when we have that first connection with industry or we're starting a project, we're trying to do that with them. Mm. 
people are not super great at telling you what their actual challenges or barriers are. And sometimes uh, both like industry or users will get latched onto some cool thing they saw in a YouTube video. And they're like, what if we built this AR experience? And we are huge AR proponents, but we try to go in very platform agnostic and say like, what are you actually trying to do? And then we pick the technology that fits that. We build a little bit, we show, you know, that target demographic, we get some feedback and we do that multiple times because we're more research focused for us, even though I work primarily with industry, we have to have a research component to the work that we do. So we're able to do that back and forth design process. And I don't know, it, it depends on the project, but you know, you might do that like four or five times, depending on what you're building or what you're testing. Like we've worked with the Atlanta Braves to build an AR experience around the, the new stadium because we moved from oh. Ted Turner Stadium, which has a lot of aura, a lot of history behind it. You can see the skyline from the stadium. But then they moved out north, not even technically Atlanta, to a brand new stadium. It has no history. It has no like vibe to it. So how do you get fans engaged with the stadium that, you know, it's – it's clean. It doesn't have anything. There's no memories there. How can you build that? So we did a bunch of, you know, focus groups and interviews, showed them stuff, tried to figure out how do people relate to a franchise or to a team in general. A lot of this ports directly to esports too. When someone doesn't know a team or a game, what are those touch points they make? And often it's with individual players. Uh, so, you know, th those kinds of research insights, I guess you'd call them, will then drive that product and we'll just kind of do it until we have a thing that is, you know, done. And then we start the next project, which might be building onto it or building around it. The, so it's like rapid prototyping, right? Exactly. Yes, yeah. it is rapid <laughs> prototyping. Some of the prototypes are rough, like they're literally paper. It, it, it looks like a game, but you can move all of the elements around on paper and we'll redesign menus or skinning for it. And it's really nice because you don't sink a lot of time into building something. You just yeah. have some art assets, you put it down on the table. It's a little bit harder now with COVID, but we've been exploring doing that in like Google Slides, like uh -huh. tools that are not meant for this so that right. participants can have that hands-on piece, just safe. I'm seeing a lot of that, like the um, taking technology over for this use case that you're describing of yeah. collaboration without the, while the, I mean, specifically Google Slides is a great example um, you, because it, you know, obviously wasn't intended, <laughs> intended for this yeah. purpose, <laughs> but it's perfect yep. for it. I mean, you know, Zoom is another really good example of a platform for conducting IDIs. I mean, you've got um, closed caption if you need it, you've mm -hmm. got, um, uh, uh, real-time transcripts you can in create a I sound like an advertisement for zoom I don't mean it like that but my point <laughs> my my point is that like there's a lot of cycles that are being applied right now to figure out how they how researchers can use you know what tools researchers can use in order to get kind of their research done so we're a scrappy industry though so it doesn't surprise me to be quite honest Emma thinking about research, you know, you spend money on UX. Uh, it's like a cost center for the business. Um, there's always an expectation of a return uh, from at least from the uh, executive team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. CFO, cough, cough. <clears throat> um, how do you measure as an internal researcher, how do you measure the ROI? Actually, this is not this is going to be a very unsatisfying answer, but we <laughs> really don't. <laughs> um, our company started very small and it like, while it has grown a lot, it still has retained some of the like heart of it. And a big part of it is that we want to focus on games and not on the money, mm -hmm. which is, that's one of the clearest things that we see is like the money is hidden in everyday things that we do. Um, everyone has access to finances and everything if they want to, but we're not given like this project has a strict budget and you have to stick with this or anything. It's always more about um, needs and like what the game needs and what the resources are at that moment. And we have then higher ups that we check with and kind of 
balance this in a wonderful way without really like mentioning money numbers at any point. It's more about hours and people that we talk about. And it's kind of weird coming from other industries where that was a big thing, but it's also very relaxed and liberating in a sense. I mean, uh, congratulations. That sounds like a really nice um, environment to be in. It sounds like consumer insights are more of like a core uh, foundational element for, um, it's more of like a cultural um, characteristic or tenant, or I'm not sure what the right word is, but core value uh, yeah. for the company. Is that a, a... It is, and like everything, <laughs> it's, it's on the same page as everything else, like programming, which is always like, we, everyone has too few programmers on their games, right? Mm -hmm. But it's on the same level, like there are programmers and they have, they don't have to think about money in the same way that we don't have to think about money and we're all doing important things for the game. So it's a lovely balance on that. How do you, where do you, give, give me some context of like where you sit organizationally. Are you working directly with the developers or marketing or like, where, you know, who are your stakeholders? Um, it depends on the project. Um, usually the easiest way to think about it is, uh, project management is my, like, they're my main stakeholders, but where I actually do my work is more on the design, like more with the designers of each team. And then we do collaboration with marketing when like our intentions and needs align, but it's more like we just bubble about or bumble about doing our own thing and then <laughs> trust management to kind of give us direction of, oh, you know, you're needed here. So kind of ship this way. And it's more about the everyday interactions with the teams to kind of have a beat on it myself as well. So I can sometimes go to project management and say, you know, maybe we should be testing this thing this way now because I know that the devs are talking about this and they're like, oh, oh man, that's cool. Or sometimes they come to me and say, you know, this team really needs help with this thing and we need to research that. So it's, it's an interesting way of doing things. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. <saying> that. <laughs> That, well, I mean, if it's not interesting, then we're not having fun. The, um, uh, you know, you have a you have a lot of titles that you've, you know, launched. Does um, do titles in in video game, but in the video game world, do they get sunset and then like kind of moved off, or um, is there some kind of like ongoing legacy that's applied from a research perspective to those games? Not in it. It's different from like game development way because we're in, like Trine is a great example. It's it has four installations. So when we start like let's say we were making a new Trine game, we would have to look at what the history is there, like what the mechanics are, how people received it, um, also technical things. There would be code that we would try to import as much, so we would incur technical debt from there, but also right. create new things. Research wise we can start on a cleaner slate. Um, we can, of course, we look at previous research done, but it's also very free of like, okay, what's happening with this game? So we don't necessarily have to focus on what's happened before, although it obviously helps to know both on the design side and research side what's been done before so we can like reflect on those, but mm -hmm. it's not as closely tied to past as other disciplines are. Laura, how about yourself? Do your do your customers do they think about the ROI when they're engaging with you, whether it's rapid prototyping or something else? Uh, you know, yes, I think sometimes there are mostly what my group does. There are two kinds of projects. There's projects like, especially in the health field, and we build also serious. They're called serious games. Nobody really likes that. Phrase no, because you've already, I already don't want to play it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And educational <laughs> games and stroke rehabilitation games and all of that, they still should be fun because we know that the traditional method is um, almost not fun most of the time. But if we're doing an applied thing like that, there's some quick wins that we can make to say like, okay, this is definitely going to help people in poverty connect with the resources that they need. That sort of thing. But the other types of projects that we do are 
much more experimental. Like a lot of, mm. we, we work with Google. So they'll come to us and they'll say something like, we think in the future people will be engaging with technology in this way, but we don't know what that tech looks like or we have that. So Google Glass, the technical components were developed at Georgia Tech with um, Thad Starner and, and researchers from my group. They're like, we have, we built this thing and we don't know how people are going to use it. So can you come up with some studies around it and see what use cases are, how that integrates with people's lives? So those studies tend to be a little bit more like a company saying, we're going to give you this money and we know that you're going to do some interesting research with it, but it might be a bust. I mean, there's right. always going to be some kind of research or insight or finding that comes out of it that's really important. But because we often work on projects that like are cutting edge or bleeding edge or any of those kind of buzzwords, sometimes you just don't really know what it's going to produce. So it's hard to really draw a straight line between we gave these researchers money and this is our, our ROI based on what they did. It's more like, we don't know what people are doing with wearables and gaming or I don't know, um, fitness games are like a mm -hmm. really challenging space. We're all kind of lazy. We just, everybody yeah. stands up and plays with the Wii and, and literally bowl or, you know, closer to literally bowls. And then we sit on the couch and we just like flick our wrists and we're, we're playing <laughs> tennis. Uh, so sometimes those connections are like not as clear for, okay, what does this actually do in terms of changing the way games are built or the way this technology works? Sometimes it's a little bit more fuzzy. I think that what's interesting there, you know, especially in context of rapid prototyping is like the big learning might just be don't place the bet, right? Um, or mm -hmm. if you're like um, uh, Pokemon Go, uh, when mm -hmm. Nintendo launched, when Nintendo launched that, I mean that's that game is still an you know, active user base, and I play right? every day. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's like a there's a, it's a really interesting. When you think about the actual ROI on research, and this is kind of like my my challenge to my colleagues in market research specifically and user user experience and CX, um, you know, is it helps us as practice as uh, agencies to um, think about what the actual, whether it's measured in savings or upside, mm -hmm. um, is uh, uh, for the research, right? Like what is that actual outcome going to be? And that, that can help a lot of times the clients um, re-communicate that back to their internal stakeholders as well. Because uh, a lot of times companies aren't actually framing it out that way. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing a ton in the VR space. Um, I was really surprised. We had a, at my last company, we had um, one of the developers that got a Google Glass. This is what, like almost eight years ago now, maybe mm -hmm. about. Um, and so it was super fun, like, you know, having that like thing yep. right there and right. Um, and, and the applications for Google Glass seem infinite. All the things like pre-flight checklists for pilots to, you know, surgical check, I mean, checklists in general, um, I think, but then also, you know, it's such a more elegant way of getting information versus something like this, right? Where you're looking at a watch, which is very distracting. Um, and one of the things that I thought would be really cool um, is if you and I could meet in person, not know each other, but have each other's LinkedIn profile or a highlight of that like pulled up um, so that we have some immediate context, creating this like short shortcut. Um, then all of a sudden now I think it's going to get like adopted by Tinder, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this is a good example that you, you bring up in terms of research. Glass is a great example. Like glass is alive and well in enterprise car factories, factories in general. But what the research could have really supported is this understanding of what we call socio-technological aspects. People really don't like that camera that is just pointing at them. And, you know, we saw that have a huge impact on society. Movie theaters banned them. There was a term that was described people wearing glass because the technical component was super sound. It was a cool, it is a cool piece of technology that people can tinker and play with and customize, but uh, it really creeps people out and it makes them feel uncomfortable. Even the wearer kind of feels like, man, I feel like 
really weird. Like I'm one out of 200 people <laughs> that's, that's wearing this thing. So if there had been some maybe more research around that, there, there are ways that you can like design that little camera eye uh, to give some clear indications like, hey, it's not on or you know, whatever, some, some other kinds of affordances so people understand and don't feel like they're being surveilled. And mm. that was one of the main downfalls of glass. But as a, as a unit, it's actually a very cool piece of tech. Yeah. I mean, you see that with like Snap being classified as a camera company as opposed to a social media platform mm. um, with their S1. And so I think, I, you know, I, I personally, and you know, of course they have their own glass. It doesn't have the, like, the flip out thing. It's just like glasses um, with a camera embedded in it. Um, they're not for me, but I'm almost 50. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, 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 you know, there is this like overarching theme of comfortability with technology that I think is really driving a lot of the, um, the things that were maybe far reaching and, you know, I'm bringing that in. And so when I think about, when I think about time on game, so how much time I spend playing or a person, a player spends, you know, um, you could go with like ready player one as kind of the, extreme example of an immersive environment um uh but like if i could like the, the shortcut is maybe it is i don't know how it works but um it just feels to me like the next generation could be in class while sitting outside at the beach or in a park or whatever and the way that that could be accomplished is probably a lot less of having this laptop in front of them and a lot more of having this this kind of lens with, yep. with um, you know, some writing utensil or what have you, right? So kind of like we're in this interesting like redefinition of what normal is um, mm -hmm. as, at a society yeah. level. Do you think that the social norms will be readjusted uh, so that something like glass becomes integrated into society anytime soon? Uh, I, I hope so. We, we're seeing a we have seen shifts in wearables and I have colleagues that only do wearable work. We, we have grants to do wearables for like assistive tech, which I think is a really mm -hmm. promising space. So for people with uh, perceptual disabilities or cognitive disabilities, wearables that can support the way that they interact and move through a world is super promising, but we still have to get over this hurdle of that socio-technical piece, particularly for assistive tech. If I'm blind and I have like a wearable sleeve that I use to interact with a kiosk or my own devices, maybe I don't want people to see that sleeve mm -hmm. or maybe I do want them to so that they know that maybe I need assistance or because we find that people who have visual impairment sometimes want to communicate to the world like, hey, I need help right now and they'll pull out their cane when they don't need it because they're hoping mm -hmm. maybe someone tells them what bus just pulled up. And other times, of course, they want to keep it hidden because people will come up to them and grab them by the arm and be like, let me help you across the street. But <laughs> we have to really consider like the form of these, whether it's on our face or if uh, people have made pendants that you wear around your neck. <laughs> so it's not exactly in your eyesight, but it's someplace else. Uh, jewelry wearables too that do similar things to glass. We have to consider like what this looks like so that it's preferable for both the wearer and the person with that wearer because otherwise we're just going to keep making tech that creeps people out <laughs> or it's <laughs> onerous to wear yeah. too like glass is kind of heavy if you wear it for a while it gets hot <laughs> i don't know if you've worn one that's like actively working that little tiny power unit here it gets kind of hot so we have to think a lot about just like the acceptability of what it looks like and what people's mental model is of what it's doing too. Like, is that camera on, not on? How do I tell? What yeah. is this person looking at? Are they looking at my LinkedIn? I haven't updated it in years, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Not me personally, but right. a lot of, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are they single? Yeah. The right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Or yeah, which getting back to that about? creepy thing. <laughs> no, For vulnerable exactly. populations, yeah. right? Like women are probably like, no, I don't want someone to be able to, you know, know who I am or where I'm from. Being able to mm -hmm. have a high level of control 
over what you are sharing with the world or not. Yeah, super and all important. And all the yeah. PII around around that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Emma, the esports. Myself, for example, I'm a bit, I like college uh, sports. Huge fan. Everything's been shut down. Um, and even though I have an avid gaming life and my family does too, you know, we're really not, we're connected to different streamers, but like we're not connected at an e-sport level. Um, in other words, there's not like a, you know, in February there's a Super Bowl normally or whatever kind yeah. of a, a thing. Do you think it, do you think we move, do you think we move towards that? Like more of this, these iconic events that take place? Um, I can only talk about uh, through my personal experience. I haven't really been watching the space as a like professional, um, but uh, my friend group, we always gather around for the international for Dota 2. So that's definitely a thing that <laughs> we do. There's the same thing for League of Legends, a similar tournament every year, uh, and also the smaller ones, but the big international things and the main one is there are big things for some games at least. Uh, but there is the problem of what team do you root for? Because mm. I could say, and I've seen people actually like out jogging that wear, say, uh, Team Liquid shirt. But I don't That's know crazy. which league they're <laughs> watching. Well, like, are mm. they like do it, like are they following CS or Counter Strike or are they like watching Defense of the Ancients too? Which game are they playing? Because now there are these big um, corporations that sponsor many different teams for diff many different games we don't have say um seahawks which is my favorite nfl team um once you say that you immediately know which team which sport but we don't have the same thing for esports yet yeah it feels a lot more um like the last little tribes as opposed to more of these like bigger bigger things laura do you have do you think that um esports is uh, people are going to start choosing esports over regular sports. Do you think that it feels a little bit more like a zero sum game in context of like time? Uh, no, I I think we're seeing a, a blurring of lines between traditional sports and esports, and this is exciting. I think so. A colleague of mine at the University of Utah, Roger Altheiser, has said that. Esports is us getting to do traditional sports over again. So we can look at the things that went well in traditional sports from how you support uh, fan communities to the technologies that support the way that we experience those, the way that the live experience is, is constructed. We can port that into esports and vice versa. So I think really they, they build off of each other. And in the same way that we've seen the breakdown of what it means to be a nerd in the past 30 years, I think we'll see that for fans of esports. Because if you read comics, uh, you know, in the 1980s or prior, you were you were a little untouchable in a lot of different kinds of social circles. But now the biggest movies are comic book movies, uh, and there's some there's some friction there for people who were like, hey, I kind of suffered for loving this thing as a kid, being bullied, and now any Yahoo can wear like an Avenger shirt and not get teased for it. I think we're starting to see that break down too for like an esports athlete is not just some, um, you know, neck beard and their mom's basement playing <laughs> whatever <laughs> Starcraft. Uh, we're, we're seeing this, this blend of like, Hey, that is a feat of athleticism. These esports athletes, their APMs, there's actions per minute are crazy. It requires a high level of, cognitive ability and reaction time and spatial awareness and game sense. So I think you'll have traditional sport fans being like, hey, you know, football season is over, but the Overwatch League is happening and I live in Atlanta, that whole piece that they're trying to do for the localism and vice versa. The Overwatch League season is about to end in a couple of weeks, uh, but there's other sports, sports, sports things that are gonna happen. <laughs> and maybe someone's like, hey, I kind of miss cheering a team I'm going to see what the Hawks are about, or uh, we, we miss our thrashers. <laughs> I miss having a hockey team here, but they might glom onto 
a traditional sport just to have something to have that kind of social connection the relation with the city that you're in just the the fun of having a viewer experience of some kind of competition so i, I, mean, I, I hope that it joins us yeah i mean you kind of see it with um the nfl and and, and of course um other sports uh but like there's a you know the madden the madden uh uh, franchise yeah, for okay. yeah right and so they'll they'll always do the Super Bowl in Madden right yeah. first to see who won <laughs> <laughs> and there's also this interest there's also this really interesting kind of like player worth like real life player worth in that is materialized in the NFL so um, whatever player gets on the title of the of Madden right um, even though now it's all digital based but you know, is that sort of the poster child for Madden, all of a sudden their relative value as an athlete now materially increases um, inside of the, absolutely increases inside of their NFL career. So it's, it's, it's funny for me to see this connection of um, a digital pretend to players getting really upset that they're, sco they aren't as fa they aren't scored as fast on Madden as their <laughs> counterpart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and also we're seeing the lines blur where uh, the Atlanta Hawks, they bought a 2K team, so they have a team of esports athletes playing NBA 2K as the Hawks, so that's like an even more kind of literal overlay of a traditional sports team owning an esports team, mimicking themselves, and we're seeing that all over the country, and I don't know, I don't know if uh, FIFA maybe in Europe is oh. similar, or there's sports clubs buying like FIFA types of teams. I don't, I don't know about that. No, uh, I've heard a story and time. I've completely forgotten the name of the game, but there was this English game that was centered on football and they like, they were doing what Madden's doing now for NFL. Um, they were mimicking the leagues and they hired actual fans to go to the games and see how people were performing and they had stats. And this was back in the day before the teams themselves had these stats. So they actually went back to the game developers to ask for these stats. And then they wow. started, like, this is how they started figuring out how to buy um, people from other um, right. teams to their thing. And they, like, they had their own systems before, but it was more touchy-feely. And now they have stats from a game that they use for this. So it has been going back and forth for a long time. Huh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, EA has a whole division around... Um, you know, basically decomposing the athlete in terms of how they, their stats. Um, I don't know what the stats are, agility, strength, size, whatever. And then, um, you know, and those, and those guys are like, or gals, people are really important <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes led and sometimes hated <laughs> based mm -hmm. on, on how, you, on how you get ranked. It's, it's kind of interesting. So just to clarify, you, you both think that it is less of a zero sum game um, in terms of uh, esports stealing share from traditional sports and more of a collaborative uh, relative growth in both categories. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think so. And I am excited about what esports borrows from traditional sports, especially in terms of technology, because there's things in traditional sports that experience that we take for granted. Right. Like in, in American football, you have the first down yard line. That's augmented reality. And that's been around for a while. Like we see a lot of computer generated stuff in a broadcast sports um, scene. You can kind of argue that watching it at home is a better supported experience than watching live in that stadium it's not the same feeling but you get a lot more information because you have this hud so mm -hmm. with esports we have this perfect knowledge of a game whereas in football they will replay the tape like well was his foot in or out or like what was right. that look at it from multiple angles with esports there's no question what happened because we have to build and we can run it back but it also means we can do things like embed in the same way still augmented reality embed ads into the game and not to like create this dystopic marketing nightmare it, it still might be preferable for a billboard in a twitch stream advertising specifically to me a specific graphics card but to you a mouse that might be preferable to be in the game doesn't impact the athletes 
to this ad sponsor saying like, why is this match going on for 30 minutes? I have not seen the ad that I paid for mm -hmm. having to wait for those breaks. And then that might encourage businesses to invest more in esports, and that bumps it up. But it's it's same tech that we're porting from traditional sports into this this game space. So I think it's going to kind of ratchet both up. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about that. All right, great. Well, we are at the end of our time. So I'd like to go out on um, one question to both of you. Uh, Laura, let's start with you. What is your personal motto? So my personal motto is borrowed from Russell Kirsch, who created the pixel, like the, the graphic length um, mm -hmm. unit. And he he would say that there, nothing is boring if you ask enough questions and you have to keep asking questions and then stuff becomes really interesting. I think that's very important in research because sometimes you get locked in on, you think that your target demographic, your user, your consumer already knows this sort of thing, or you think you know what they're thinking about, like you have a locked in mental model, but the purpose of research is to do this. You have to just keep asking questions. So even if you think you know, you still have to do that, sit down, do an interview, do that focus group. So that, that's what I try to like think about all the time. I'll think I know something. I'm like, well, let's actually just like create an interview and, and see if that's right. Emma, what about yourself? What is your personal motto? Mine's super similar. And now I'm thinking I'm stealing it from someone that I just can't <laughs> credit them. But it's stay curious because mm -hmm. there's always more to learn, whether it's a thing, a topic or a method, a person or an event or whatever, be it work of like, how are my players like, reflecting on this or feeling about this thing or you come home and what's my partner thinking about today mm -hmm. uh, everything <laughs> is like you should always be asking questions and being curious of what's going on around you because once you get complacent there are going to be problems my guests today have been laura levy and emma rajo sorry thank you both <laughs> no for worries. being on the happy market research podcast today Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Everybody else, it has been a pleasure having you join us for this very first video, what it looks like when we do a podcast with out or with adding video, which has been interesting for me and a little bit uh, unnerving. So, um, but it's been great seeing <laughs> our guests' faces today. Ladies, again, really thank you very much. As always, I appreciate you tuning in. If you have any questions or want to reach out to me, please do. You can find me on LinkedIn, Jamin Brazil, um, or on probably any other social platform except Snapchat and maybe TikTok, not as active there either. All right. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>